Hi, I'm Brian Price for Real Vision, and today I'll be speaking with Dr. Bill Janeway, noted investor and author of Doing Capitalism in the Innovation Economy. We're going to delve into what he took away from his greatest success as well as his greatest failure during a career that spanned over half a century. Additionally, we're going to explore how governments, Bitcoin, President Trump, venture capital, unicorns, and climate change all manage to impact one another. Bill, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us in Real Vision for the first time. I know the audience is excited to hear from you. I'm excited to hear from you. Thank you for being here. That's delight. I'm really delighted to be with you. So I want to start off, we've got a lot to get into, but I want to start off with your career and how you got to where you are and what you would say were the moments that were instrumental in your success to getting to where you are today. Well, it's been a kind of uh, contingent and haphazard journey. Uh, began at Princeton, uh, where I graduated a long time ago, great class of 65. Yes, that's Bill Bradley's class. And uh, I got a Marshall Scholarship, which was a real, just a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to go to Cambridge University. I'd already read a good deal of Keynes, the economist, the great economist, and I was really, really motivated to study under his students. He died back in 1946, but his students were very, very active. So I did a doctorate at Cambridge, which was fairly unusual in those days, in economics. It turned out that my work there, on the one hand, seemed to be a dead end, and on the other hand, proved to be enormously valuable, really providing an unfair advantage. So how does that work? First, I realized when I had gotten my doctorate that I did not want to pursue the academic career that I, I thought I had been doomed or destined for. Uh, and that was partly a function of my own thinking about what I wanted to do, but also economics was moving into a mode of abstract mathematization, removed progressively further and further from the world in which people actually live, work, spend, save, borrow, go broke, make money. And I knew that I wanted to be more directly involved in that. On the other hand, I wrote my PhD thesis on 1929 to 1931 in Britain. Well, who knew that in 1999, having lived mentally in the world of 1929, I could say, hey, I've seen this movie before. I know how it ends. It ends with a crash. And then in 2007, eight, you know, I'd seen, I'd lived in the great monetary financial crisis that ushered in the Great Depression in 1931-32. So that work at Cambridge served me as enormously valuable 30, 40, a generation later. But in between, I found myself in the early 1970s and in old Wall Street, where there were hundreds of private partnerships subsidized as members of the New York Stock Exchange by the ability to charge fixed rates for brokerage commissions. Volume trading was very low. You couldn't compete on price. Competition was either, hey, we all went to school together, or what I have to say was in those days, the, the three Bs, booze, babes, and baseball tickets, <laughs> or really being smart. And there were a small number of firms that were committed to doing really deep fundamental investment research. And I found myself in one of those firms that was exclusively focused on the science-based industries from, from chemicals to pharmaceuticals to electronics and the early stages of computing. It was called F. Eberstadt. It was a wonderful partnership. We had a wonderful dozen, 15 years of running room uh, before the rug was pulled out from that, under that kind of firm when brokerage commissions became competitive and negotiated, which meant that the, the big institution told the little specialist brokerage firm what they were going to pay, and that was progressively from 20 cents a share to nothing a share. And the path for our kind of fundamental research was either commoditization, nobody's going to pay you for it, you can't afford to do good work, or frankly, prostitution, which means that your research was basically devoted to earning fees from the companies you were supposed to be covering. And we decided that 
we weren't going to be good at either of those games. So we sold the firm to a, a British group. And I spent three years working out my contract. But really, having learned, and this is what we'll talk about some, I'd learned a lot about what was being, be, had been come to be called venture capital. First as a kind of outsider, and then progressively more and more inside. And in 1988, I had the extraordinary good fortune to join the great firm of Warburg Pincus, which had just raised the first billion dollar fund that any firm, any venture, buyout, private equity firm had ever raised, and was determined, the founders were determined to explore investing more as a direct lead principal investor in technology, which meant increasingly meant information technology. And I was hired to take a shot and see if we could do that. And that's what I spent. Well, I've, been, I've been associated with the firm for 30 years now. We, and, and we can talk some about how we put to work some of the things we'd learned along the way. And uh, I returned in 2006 when I retired as vice chairman at Warburg Pincus. I returned to my old academic roots in Cambridge just in time for the global financial crisis to make economics a really interesting subject again. And that, that's where I'm immersed now, and, and that's where a lot of the thinking that went into my, into my book, uh, Doing Capitalism in the Innovation Economy, came from, the framing and the analysis around the, the narrative, around the stories of how the innovation econ economy works. So as we continue to unpack your career, in your success. One thing I always like to get into with guests for the audience to also learn about is failure. Yeah. Because I think people see you and they see the success and they see the track record and they say, all right, well, he's got it figured out. But I don't think anybody can get to where somebody like you have gotten to without failure. So is there a particular teachable moment that you had to go through that a young investor watching might learn from? How, how much time do you have? <laughs> a lot of teachable moments, and they came at, at various stages. Early on, in the very early days at Eberstadt, we discovered that we had a really deep relationship of trust with our institutional investors, our customers, for the research we were producing. And on the other hand, because we were so deep into these science-based industries, we came on these emerging new companies at a time in the 1970s when there was almost no market for initial public offerings. Between the first oil crisis and the end of Volcker's war on inflation, you could almost count the number of companies that went public. A few of them, Tandem Computer, Federal Express, Federal Express is still around, Genentech still around, but they were very, very few. 